you're about to listen to one of my heroes, one of my real heroes. The problem with Claire is we need like a whole nother section just to give her resume because it's unbelievable. We were totally thrilled, obviously, when she agreed to speak here. She's appeared countless times as a guest on our radio show, Cowboy Logic Radio, as Don has mentioned. And in one word, half of what she tells us is terrifying. She is a member of our wonderful Talk America Radio kitchen cabinet. If you go to talkamericaradio.us, talk you'll see our kitchen cabinet kind of formulated after another president from years ago. And that's our, just some of the greatest people and thinkers of our time that really are trying to do what they can to reshape America and make it better for our kids. Her resume is extensive. <sighs> Again, we read, when we read her bio, it's like I gotta, <laughs> it takes the whole darn time. She's Vice President for Research and Analysis at the Center for Security Policy, a senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research and a member of the Board of Advisors for the Canadian McKenzie Institute. In 2016, she was named Senator Ted Cruz's Presidential Campaign National Security Advisory Team, on the team. Since 2013, she served as a member of the Citizens Commission on Benghazi. Former Vice President of the Intelligence Summit, she was a career operations officer with the CIA, a professor at the Center for Counterintelligence and Security Studies, Executive Director of the Iran Policy Committee from 2005 to 2006, and served as a consultant, intelligence analyst, and researcher for a variety of uh, defense firms. She was named a 2011 Lincoln Fellow at the Claremont Institute. Already an advisor to the EMP Act America in February of 2012, Claire Lopez was named a member of the Congressional Task Force on National and Homeland Security, which focuses on the electromagnetic pulse, EMPs, and the threat to our nation. She's been a visiting researcher and guest lecturer on counterterrorism, national defense, international relations at Georgetown. She's a regular contributor to print and just about anywhere else you might want to see. I gotta skip down here because this is unbelievable. She received a BA in communications in French from Notre Dame, the College of Ohio, in Ohio that is, and an MA in uh, international relations from the Maxwell School of Syracuse University. She completed Marine Corps Officers Candidate School, that's not enough, in Quantico, Virginia before declining a military commission. <laughs> and in her spare time, she takes Farsi lessons, like she has spare time. Ladies and gentlemen, Claire Lopez. Thank you, Don and Donna. That was certainly over the top, but much appreciated. And thanks to all of you for being here and um, being here today, tomorrow, the next day uh, for this so important summit on national security. Thanks to Joe Dugan, of course, for his outstanding efforts at putting this together for the I forget how many years in a row. Thank you, Joe, and all of your volunteer team as well. So we've got time for one more dose of reality this afternoon before you uh, get released to go off and uh, ponder it all and, and, and maybe have some dinner. Okay, with one more dose of reality? All right. So you've heard today from a number of speakers who have talked about the different enemies, the ways that the United States, America, is under assault. Well. I want to talk to you about an assault that is coming at us domestically inside the United States, from within the United States. And this is from an enemy axis that we sometimes call at the Center for Security Policy the red-green axis. And I'll explain why we call it that. Because it includes the Muslim Brotherhood, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the hard left, uh, communist, Marxist, Leninist, Antifa coalition, what I sometimes call the Saul Alinsky acolytes, if you will. You're going to hear a lot more about that tomorrow from Trevor Loudon, who knows that subject probably better than anyone else I know. All of this, this entire red-green axis, funded by hard leftist groups, foundations, and individuals. 
Now, the target of all of this is the Constitution itself. It's our system of law and order. It's our traditional Judeo-Christian-based American society overall. It's not a particular candidate. It's not a particular party. It is our system as it exists now and as it was founded uh, by our founding fathers. Now, some of this is brought to us, uh, unfortunately, in all of the latest updates about the Fusion GPS, Clinton, Democratic National Committee, FBI, Department of Justice scandals, about which we've heard quite a bit today from earlier wonderful speakers. But the most important of all of this is about how absolute power in the hands of amoral thugs pose the most critical threat of all to our republic. Now, what I will tell you here today is of a piece with that. It's not about that specifically, but it's not separate, and it's not disconnected from all of that either. It extends the enemy axis and those who support it even more broadly, including internationally, and we'll get to that. Now, there are three major elements, as I mentioned, to this red-green axis, and we're gonna talk about each one in turn. The U.S. Muslim Brotherhood, the Black Lives Matter movement, and a communist, anarchist uh, cabal of what I call the Saul Alinsky uh, mold of, of anarchists um, who are in the tradition, quite literally, of the Russian Revolution of 1917. So we'll start with the Muslim Brotherhood, right? In the United States, I don't know if, if you all uh, know this, but in 2014, and the Center for Security Policy has written quite extensively about this, including in a book that we call the Star Spangled Sharia. The Muslim Brotherhood front groups, many of them in the United States, formed an umbrella group of a, of a kind. And so I'm talking about CARE, ICNA, ISNA, I'm sorry, not ISNA, they're not part of it, but they're affiliated with it, uh, and other well-known Muslim Brotherhood front groups in this country formed an umbrella group and they called it the USCMO, United States Council of Muslim Organizations. Now, that group, we thought, was unique to the United States, that only in the United States had these Muslim Brotherhood front groups come together. Lo and behold, we find out in early 2016 that uh, there was a conference held in Crystal City, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C., in February of that year, and it brought together the councils, plural, of Muslim organizations from countries all over the world. Represented at that conference in Crystal City were Muslim Brotherhood front groups from, let's see if I can even remember them all. We had Canada, Britain, France, Spain, Germany, Germany Italy, uh, other continents were represented, El Salvador, Brazil, were represented, South Africa was represented, Australia was represented, New Zealand was represented. All of those, and I'll add one more in a moment, were at that conference. That means that the Muslim Brotherhood is organized in this way of councils, umbrella groups, not just inside the United States, but they've got a network across the entire world. Now, they haven't held an international conference since, but I expect that they will at some point again. Now, the other country that I didn't mention, and I really need to bring up in more detail than any of the others, I think, uh, that was represented at that February 2016 Crystal City meeting, but not advertised, really, not, not um, uh, put out there in front as all the others uh, with their flags and their representations, but that country is Turkey. Turkey was represented not openly, but it was there at the February 2016 councils of Muslim organizations from around the world. Turkey? That's our NATO ally, right? Well, we'll see about that. What you have in Turkey now is the rise to power of the president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and his AK party, AKP. They were rising to power throughout the 2000s. 
They have always been supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood, directly of Hamas in Gaza, which is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, they are in control, complete control of Turkey now. Not only that, but they are working directly with the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood in this country. Turkey, the government of Turkey. Now, in 2016, in July of that year, President Erdogan came over to the United States for a special dedication ceremony. That ceremony was to inaugurate the new great big Turkish Islamic Center of Lanham, Maryland. It is on a 16-acre site, includes a mosque, very many conference rooms, guest rooms, all kinds of, of, of different facilities there. It is the hub of the Turkish involvement and work with the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood in this country. And in fact, it is actually owned by a department of the Turkish cabinet called the Dianet. The Dianet is, is sort of short uh, for this cabinet department in the Turkish government that is in, in, in control of all of Turkey's Islamic religious affairs in that country. They own the Lanham, Maryland site, and from there use that as a hub to work with the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood in this country. Um, all right, let's, um, let's go to the next element in this uh, red-green axis, and that is the Black Lives Matter movement. In 2016, even earlier in 2015, at, at a conference, more than one conference really, but where the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood was represented in particular, and especially by CARE, that is Council on American Islamic Relations, as John Wandola is going to tell you tomorrow, that is basically Hamas doing business as CARE in this country, uh, has an executive director, one of the founders, and at the time of the founding of CARE, by the way, he was one of the top leaders of Hamas in America. That's how we know that CARE is Hamas in America. Nihad Awad openly announced before cameras and microphones in the world that CARE explicitly would be working with the Black Lives Matter movement in America during our 2016 electoral campaign season. Now, a little bit about the Black Lives Matter movement. It was formed in 2013 in the wake of the uh, Ferguson riots in Missouri. It openly declares itself to be anarchist, communist, anti-Israel. Uh, this is all on its website and other publications as well as its own speeches and announcements. Um, it formed, the Black Lives Matter movement formed in the beginning as a Marxist-Leninist front of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. Itself, that one, the, the, the Freedom Road Socialist Organization is itself openly Marxist openly socialist, anti-Israel, aligned with Palestinian terrorists, meaning Hamas and Hezbollah, and uses the term, by any means necessary. What, by any means necessary? The overthrow of the US government, that's what. Now, these groups also are kind of umbrella groups, and within them are many other subgroups. Uh, within some of these groups are your black power groups, your black nationalist groups, your black separatist groups. And when I say separatist, I really mean separatist. There are, among the Black Lives Matter movement, elements that have declared five southern states, yours is one of them, by the way, South Carolina, uh, that should be the separatist breakaway nation uh, for black Americans. Among others are other southern states, total of five, that they openly declare should secede from the United States and should be the black uh, African, the black American uh, homeland. Uh, okay, the third group in this red-green axis. You're beginning to see why we're calling it red and green. The green, Islam, the red, the communist and leftist, which we are going to get to right now. The anarchists, the Antifa, again, another umbrella group. Uh, Saul Alinsky acolytes. You've all heard of Saul Alinsky, right? Everybody has, for sure. Rules for Radicals, his 
basic blueprint, his handbook for anarchy in the streets, for revolution in America. The Antifa origins, what a lot of people might not realize, go back to the early 20th century in Europe. In fact, to the 1920s and the 1930s, specifically, especially in Germany, in Italy, and in Spain. This, in the decade, the 20s, right after, you'll remember, there was a revolution in Russia in 1917 in which the Bolsheviks, the communists, took power. The offs offshoots of that revolution formed groups within all of these European countries I just named, and also at the same time rising in these same places were Nazis, the original Nazis. And when the so-called the brown shirts and the black sh shirts mixed it up on the streets and went uh, in, in, into open warfare, literally, on the streets of Germany, Germany and Italy and Spain, that was the origin of the conflict you're seeing right here in America right now. Most people don't know that, though, but that's where it comes from. And the origins of Antifa, which is short for anti-fascist, are communist, quite literally communist. That's where they come from. Now, in the, in, in the United States, Antifa emerged as Antifa, that term, uh, basically in, in early 2016, I'd say, uh, and emerged during the presidential campaign. Um, perhaps a lot of its members and followers, I would, I, I would suppose, probably have no idea of the actual origins of this group. They have no idea when they, they prattle on about socialism and communism where this actually started, or even what these systems really are. I suggest a few of them might want to take a trip on down to Venezuela, a place where I spent two years serving at our US Embassy there in Caracas, and see what it's like to have to stand in line every single day for toilet paper, baby diapers, formula, and just basic necessities of life and food every single day. Why? Because the socialist system in Venezuela is in complete and full collapse. The last I heard, I think their inflation rate had topped 2,000 uh, per year, percent per year. It, it, that, I'm probably way off with that number because it's way beyond that by now. That's socialism. It doesn't work. Um, but nevertheless, these who march and rant and rave and demonstrate on behalf of Antifa in support of what some of them call communism, but probably have no idea what it is, uh, they declare openly that their objective is the collapse of America. You've probably seen their, their posters, their placards on the street. Uh, become ungovernable is one of them. Uh, sweep the system away. Again, what I was saying, they, their intent is to sweep the American system away, not a particular candidate or politician or political party. The system, that's their goal. Um, supposedly, they are uh, against white supremacism and fascism. I'm not sure they even know what the terms mean, but this is what they spout. Uh, but they don't have any platform, any program for what would come next if they ever were to succeed in collapsing the system. There's, there's no uh, outline or blueprint for that. It's just now, collapse the system. Now, among the key members of Antifa, are these groups, Refuse Fascism, Revolutionary Communist Party USA. You thought they were gone, right? Uh, they're not gone. Revolutionary Communist Party USA, World Workers Party, Indivisible, and uh, some uh, civic leadership of some places you probably recognize, Charlotte, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, and Berkeley, California. Let me mention the Berkeley one. The mayor, a Berkeley, California, is or at least has been an online Facebook member of a group called, guess what, wait for it, by any means necessary, the mayor of Berkeley. So if you wonder at the response of the mayors, the city councils, uh, even the law enforcement of, of cities like these, you need look no further than their allegiances. And I'll tell you what, it's amazing how much people are willing to put up on the internet. It's as though they, they think none of us has ever heard of the internet or how to use it, um, but there's an awful lot there uh, just for the looking. Um, all right, so I've outlined to you three different groups that seem pretty different, 
Muslim Brotherhood, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the communist-based Antifa movement, or anarchist movement. How in the world could groups like these ever align and work together? Well, I would suggest to you that what we're looking at here is what I would call Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals meets Al-Qaeda's Management of Savagery. Anybody ever hear of that last one, Management of Savagery? Oh, of course, John has, and a few others have too, um, and Steve, naturally. All right, but I'll tell you then, uh, Management of Savagery is a document that was posted online in 2004. And as far as I know, it's never been printed in any kind of hard copy. It's only online. Uh, and it was posted by uh, an Al-Qaeda operative. And uh, what it outlines, it's, it's, it's really a blueprint. It's a handbook for how to take advantage of chaos, how to create chaos. That's Saul Alinsky rules for radicals, to create chaos such that it overwhelms the system. And then management of savagery is how to take advantage and manage the period of savagery and societal collapse that they're all seeking to induce in our country and manage it in such a way that they come out on top, that they come out, uh, you know, the winners, and they can set the agenda after whatever that agenda is going to be. And each thinks that its group is going to be the one that comes out on top. So rules for radicals plus management of savagery. That's what we're looking at. Whether all the followers of these groups understand that or know that, now you do. So the objective, again, uh, is anarchy. It is chaos. It is overwhelming law enforcement. It is civil disorder. And then out of which each of them, these groups, hopes to be the one to capitalize and win and come out on top. So what do we do about it? I don't want to send you all off to dinner in complete gloom and dismay. So I would say, number one, the most important thing for us to do is first of all to know who we are. And that means to understand where we came from. What are our principles, our foundational principles? We are children of the Enlightenment. That means we are the luckiest people on the face of the earth to inherit the principles, the traditions, the philosophy of those thinkers, those great Western thinkers of Western civilization that brought us the European Enlightenment. What I would call first things principles is what we inherit from them. What do I mean by that? First things principles in the United States means those things that are so dear to us that we will fight and die to preserve them. What would those be? Individual liberty, government by consent of the governed, I would say. Uh, certainly private property, the right to ownership, the right that is pursuit of happiness. Freedom of speech and belief and assembly and all of those others in not just the First uh, Amendment, but all of the others. Those are first things principles. Hmm? Uh, uh, absolutely keep and bear arms because that's what protects all the rest. So those are first things principles. That is who we are. That is what we defend with our lives, our sacred honor. Our lives, our property, and our sacred honor. And so once we know that, then we understand a little better when something that is not that comes against us. If you don't know who you are, if we don't know who we are, how will we ever know when what is not us assaults us? We won't. And that's the whole point of what's going on on the left. Everything is mush. Everything is, you know, whatever you feel like today. I woke up this morning and I, I identified as an armadillo and I, I'm still looking for the bathroom, but okay. So we have to cherish that history, that heritage. Teach it to our children, children's children, other children that may be in the family. Make sure that our schools and the schools that those children attend also are teaching and cherishing those principles, those foundational principles. Take a look at the textbooks. Look at what's being taught in the textbooks. One of the things that uh, some of us do uh, is actually go on there's this thing, it's called Amazon.com, and um, they sell some of the textbooks there that are used in Islamic schools, madrasas, all across the United States. And they're primarily for the K to 12 uh, grade levels, 
different books, different levels, but you, would ima you cannot imagine how closely those textbooks teach and follow everything you heard Steve Coughlin talk about this morning and you'll hear John Guandola talk about tomorrow. All right, I'm being told my time is up. A couple more ideas for you just to uh, give an idea of what we can do. And, and you've heard this from others before today too, that is, uh, be active. The first thing is that you're informed. The next thing is that you are engaged citizens. Uh, blog, chat, post, write, if, if this is what you would like to do. Uh, call into shows, radio shows, TV shows, if they have a call-in option. Uh, certainly discuss things with your family, your, your friends, your circle of, uh, uh, the, the circles that you are uh, friendly with. Uh, that means your faith communities, if you belong to one. Suggest speakers, some of those you've heard today and will hear tomorrow and the next day. Suggest them to your groups, whether it be a book club or whether it be a faith community. Um, suggest them for town hall meetings. Attend town, town hall meetings. Let candidates or those who might think about becoming a candidate uh, know where you stand on these issues and help them to, to understand your thinking about these and introduce them to people who can further uh, educate them and brief them if they're willing to do that. Um, I'll tell you what, on the other side, they are doing this intensively. I mean, uh, uh, cultivating and nourishing and, and educating, bringing up the next generation. We're not doing it so well. The other side is. And then finally, know who the enemy is. And that's part of listening to many of the speakers here at this conference today. Don't be fooled by their chants and their slogans, but know by doing a bit of homework, perhaps, who exactly they are, then call them out for who and what they are, which is not us. Thank you very much.